Now here's the larger grand strategy that you need to keep on being aware of and when you hear it you're going to at first sort of laugh because it's something you've known like forever. The whole story here is about power versus love. The talk about righteousness and justice is basically based on an idea of something that's called right and something that's called wrong. And the idea of righteousness is to make right or ensure right or judge what is wrong in the name of right. But righteousness of itself is not love. It's sort of robotic by itself. It's a tool. It is a tool of a will. So it depends on what that will knows and whether that will loves. Okay, but you can love something that's bad too. In which case your idea of righteousness is going to be wrong. All right. And a lot of people are like that. Okay, the Muslim thinks that it's righteous to kill the infidel. Okay, but the Muslim's idea of life, idea of God and everything else is completely wrong. But he doesn't know that. So he's operating on a lie and he doesn't even know that that's what he's doing. So then the third element is truth. So you've got righteousness, justice, which is the execution of righteousness, and truth in order to determine whether what's deemed righteous really is. But without love, all those three things, which are alike tools, won't be properly used. And by proper, I mean happy, true happiness. True happiness is not feeling good. Feeling good is just feeling good. You can feel good because of drugs, all right? And they harm your body and they can kill you, but you will still feel good. You can feel good because you had a meal full of the types of foods that make you feel good, but those foods might, you know, kill you in the sense of, you know, being too fatty or whatever. In other words, feeling and taste don't aren't reliable indicators of what is actually good or bad. So now pretend you're God. You can make truth be anything you want. You can make, therefore, righteousness and justice be anything you want. They're tools. This is what the Calvinists don't understand. They think God is constrained by his attributes. They don't understand God at all. Will determines. That's something the Calvinists all will, will tell you. And they're right. God is sovereign. Okay, hi, he's not sovereign if he's constrained. If his other attributes limit him in any way, then he's not omnipotent and he's not God. It's the will that's first. Now, if God were having a will that was not choosing free truth, not choosing free righteousness, not choosing free justice, then he'd be very unhappy. And, of course, if he's not free, then he's not God either. You get that. You see, this is why Calvinism and Catholicism and pretty much every single denomination on the planet wouldn't know God if he bit them. So he does. But he does in order to train them. He's not doing it to spite or to hurt or to get even or even to punish. He loves the Lord loves truth and righteousness. That's in Psalm 37 and Psalm 89. His will loves. So love is not to destroy. Any kind of, what do you want to call it, punishment or hurt. It's all designed to teach something. To get the person past whatever their thought pattern or nature is to something higher and better. The only reason hell exists forever is to teach 
<clears throat> God is never willing that anyone should perish. Second Peter three nine. Never willing. It uses both forms of the Greek negative, ook and me. Ook denies the fact, and me denies the idea. God isn't even willing for the idea of anybody perishing. Okay, well then if they can't perish, they got to go somewhere if they don't want him. So hell is just this big, painful training facility. Why? Because when you're negative to God, the only language you understand is pain. If you hurt enough, you might change your mind. Hopefully you get that. God loves, so he isn't going to create in order to destroy. He creates in order to unite. That's the end of, of uh, First Ephesians. Ephesians 1. Filling all in all. Truth has to be free, therefore, to include all the negative, so it can unite it to all the positive. The only difference is... That we who are smaller can't appreciate how that works. We don't have the knowledge. Okay, but God's out to give it to us. And of course, getting that knowledge hurts. Life hurts. You find that out sooner or later. Life hurts, love hurts, hate hurts, good hurts, bad hurts, everything hurts. But if it hurts for a good reason, you don't mind. And as you first start to learn pain, you go through all kinds of, you know, why. <clears throat> and the opportunity, of course, just as with hell, only on a much smaller level, is to learn something. Why did God let this happen? Why is there pain? I and mean, frankly, pain is the one big proof that God exists. Because a mindless nature of just autonomic processes wouldn't create pain. There wouldn't be any feeling at all. It'd be robotic. Everything would be robotic, like we see in nature. Plants don't have pain. They live and they die, but they don't have pain. Animals, I can't say that they don't have pain, but... They don't have awareness. Humans have awareness. And it's through our awareness that we look at the animal and we say we do not want it to suffer pain. Where do you think we got that from? The one who never wants anyone to suffer. But, and this is a famous Jewish expression that's encoded in Hebrews 8 and 9, is it suffering if it's learning? Imaten nipaten. My pastor covered that. He was explaining that that's a, a paranomasia, a pun. Imaten and nipaten rhyme. Christ learned through what he suffered, is what the verse says. Okay, but there's a famous Jewish cultural idea behind it. Is it suffering if it's learning? If you're learning something or you're getting something that you value as a result of the suffering, you, you're going to go through the suffering. You work, don't you? And why do you work? To get a paycheck or to get something out of the job you're doing. You actually value the kind of work you do. You find it interesting or useful or meaningful to you. So you're willing to work. Well, God is willing to work with us. Your big clue to his whole nature is the fact that he invented P. P preceded sin. We have to pee and we defecate. That preceded sin. It's low, it's small, it's humiliating. And why did he make it a pleasure to do it? Mindless nature wouldn't do that. It's a justice. Right there, the whole concept of God's sense of justice is, in, is encapsulated. Every time you urinate, every time you defecate, there's a pleasure that goes with it. Why? And why in something so humiliating and small and limiting? Because God wants to be in everything no matter how disgusting and small and slow and low. 
because he wants truth to be free. And it can't be free if it's not infinite spectrum all the way to the bottom, all the way to the top. So that's the strategy. Love over power. God has the power to do anything. He did not have to make us be like this. Adam was like this before he sinned. He had to eat just like you do. He had to sleep just like you do. He was limited in what he could do just like you are. I mean, he, his limits were a little bit higher in terms of his strength and smarts. But you know what? He was still weak. Now the angels are bigger and better and they don't need to pee and they don't need to eat and they don't need to sleep. And they can just blink themselves into any dimension they want. When it says three heavens, I'm pretty sure that means dimensions. And you walk through a dimension like you walk through a door if you've got the power to do that. Well, they do. They're instantly in heaven one second and instantly down here another second. It's not time travel. Okay, but the issue is still the same. Down here in our small, weak state, it's power versus love. And I'll never understand why people are so hung up on having power. The, the idea behind it, I sort of understand. The idea of having power so, so that you can get something you want done. Okay, but then it boils down to what is it that you want done? And why? And you know something? And I learned this starting when I was very young... But, you know, it's, it's an ongoing lesson. There's always more to learn. It, getting what you want doesn't make you happy. Sometimes. But it kind of depends on what it is you want. So then that goes to the love issue. What do you love? And the people who want power down here, they really want it so they can think well of themselves. See, I'm more powerful than you. I walk through a forest and the trees bend out of my way. I can look at somebody and strike them dead. Oh, 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 look how great I am. Okay, fine, you're standing on the mountain and you're all alone, pounding your chest. Me, number one, on top of the mountain over everybody else. Whoopee. I don't understand how anybody can enjoy having power over someone else. So what? You have power over that person. That means whatever that person is of that person's own accord doesn't mean anything to you. It's just one great big psychic masturbation, excuse me. Oh, I'm greater than you. I'm better than you. So? Are you happier? They think that getting more power makes them happy. How? I'm more powerful than an ant, and I'm telling you right now, the fact that I'm more powerful than an ant does not give me one iota of happiness. I'm smarter than most people on this planet. And you know what it's given me all my life? Pain. I'm going to start crying now because I hate this. All my life, I've been smarter than most people, and you know what? They hate me. They resent me, they're jealous, they're insecure, they're afraid. But my being smart doesn't mean anything to me unless I can help somebody with it. I don't think less of somebody who's dumber than me because they're dumber. They're whoever they are. The person is a whole person. And they have thoughts and feelings and needs and desires and he can't get close to them because they're so upset about you being smarter than them. So yeah, I have more power than they do. So what? Does it help have a relationship? No, it hurts. I end up having to live alone. The guys that I've dated, oh, you think too much. You're too smart for me. I feel inferior to you. Oh, great. What kind of relationship can you have then? Or they feel they need to be toadies. Or they feel they need to compliment me all the time. They just can't be themselves because this thing that I've got that's greater than them is in the way. 
I didn't earn or deserve this. And it's got its advantages, but what advantage is it if you can't have a relationship with somebody? You see the difference? Power versus love. Yeah, but the power gets in the way of the love. It destroys the love. It prevents the love. So then what's more powerful then? The love has to be. Because the power is no good. i got to turn this off for a second. Now, being smart isn't the only example. You could be superior to somebody else because of money. You could be superior to somebody else because of health. You can be superior to somebody else because you look better. But everybody who's got those superiorities faces the same issue that I just cried about. And I'm trying not to cry about it again. It separates. It hurts. People think that relationships are supposed to be based on superiority. But then when you actually have a relationship that's based on superiority, it falls apart. There's always a superiority standing between you and the other person you want the relationship with. So how can anybody think that getting more power is going to win them the girls or approbation or anything else? It doesn't. Now, God is the most powerful person. He knows this better than I do. And in fact, he walked me through it. It took me years before I understood what was the problem. Because I don't regard myself as smart. I don't regard my smarts as meaning anything to me. That's not what I live for. Yeah, and that's not what he lives for either. So what does he do with this power? He goes all the way to the bottom and makes even pee pleasant. That's the whole idea of God's nature in a nutshell. You want to know God? Look at your pee. There's a philosophy there. There's an attitude there. There's a high. Look at, I made you and I don't care if you're smaller. I just want you. As you are. What you are. Good or bad or indifferent. I love you and I made you for that very reason. God is not willing anybody should perish. That's the strategy. Now, Satan's strategy is really a carom. You know, like caroming, like when you hit a billiard ball and it, you hit it into the sidewall and then it goes into the opposite pocket. Satan is a lot like God. God made him. Of course, he'd be a lot like God. He grew spiritually in a, to a great extent. I'm, I'm still not sure quite how much. <sighs> Something short of total maturity. Because it gets harder. The more mature you are, it gets harder to live with this knowledge. So he grew a lot. And the problem for him was always the same. See, when you've got something superior to somebody else and you finally do know it, you feel like, you know, you, you out of respect for the others, you got to take care of it. You have a duty to live up to because you have something they don't have. If, and this is taught to you if you're born royal or you're born with money or you're, you know, famous. You, you learn this lesson. Hi, you have an asset that others don't have and you need to use it for them because they don't have it. You have privileges they don't have. And it's a real hard thing to live with, even if you don't have the relationship problems I just outlined. And Satan did learn that, and he got into it. He got into caring about himself. He got into trying to maintain himself and, and think well and because he loved God and he loved those below him. See, he's not devil with two horns and a tail. He's an incomplete person. He incompletely grew in love. And you know what? My pastor is the only one who taught that. Although I've seen movies where they sort of hinted at it. He didn't quite go far enough before he fell. He was looking at God. He was looking at himself. He was looking at those below him. And one of the things that got to him the most was the fact that compared to God, even he and everybody, all the other angels were so much lower. 
even though they're, you know, eons higher than us. And, he, and it just jarred him. Because it's the same old problem as I started this with. This other person is superior. You're looking at this other person superior. And do you get resentful? Do you feel inadequate as a result? And the answer is, of course you do. That's normal. Okay, but then what do you do? do you, how do you weather that? Do you just enjoy the fact that, hi, here's the superior person, but that person loves you, so it doesn't matter. The person doesn't love you because you're not, because you're unequal or lower. They just love you because they love you. Because a person isn't his goodies. The person's just the person. And so what he wants us to do is to come to come to see it that way. The same way he sees us, he wants us to see him. So he makes Pete. And he makes it pleasant. That right there is your big advertisement. Hi, I'm not trying to lord it over you. I don't want you so that I can, you know, say ha ha and better. I just want you. And as you learn to love God, what you find out, and this is really weird, and pastors don't cover this either, not even my own. You get to the point where you wouldn't care if God were the janitor. You wouldn't care if God had no power or no authority. It's his character. It's the way he thinks. And you just you just can't live without him because the way he thinks is so gorgeous. And so that when the inevitable testing of the abuse comes in, you know, where God seems to abandon you and stuff like that. You know, because that's all lead up to the cross. You know, same paradigm. You're glad for it because it gives you an outlet. And you still don't want to live without him. Like Job, you say, I know in my flesh I'll see God. Because all you care about is seeing him. And it doesn't matter about his power. And it doesn't matter about his status. And it doesn't matter that he's superior. And it doesn't matter that he's hurting you. It just matters that he's him. Then, then you realize that that's his attitude toward you. It just matters that you're you. That is the strategy of love over power. The power is used to effect, E-F-F-E-C-T, meaning to bring into action, put into operation. The power is used to effect the love. Satan didn't get that far to learn that. I mean, he knows the lesson better than I do. And yet he didn't learn it. I know it better than him. It kills me because I admire Satan, actually. Everybody would. In fact, that's what, you know, the Bible actually tells you. He's admirable. He just didn't go far enough. And what he inevitably came to do, and he admires God more than the rest of us, honey. He's in love with God just like the rest of us, except far more. But he came to think, oh... Something's wrong with the way God has done this. Something's wrong with the way God thinks. He's being unfair in that he didn't give us more abilities. So we suffer too much. That's basically Satan's attitude. He's messianic. He thinks he's saving. Why do you think he hasn't caved in to God after all this time? How old, how old is the universe? Four billion years old, the so-called scientists say, except they're dead wrong. I don't know how wrong and in what way, but they're dead wrong because they factor things. When they factor age, whether it's carbon dating or anything else, they're assuming constant rates. But that can't happen because of the law of entropy. In other words, when a thing degrades in carbon dating, they're assuming a constant rate of degradation. So when they date a thing, using that constant rate, they're coming up with some idea of how old the article is based on a constant rate of degradation. But the law of entropy tells you that can't work. Okay, when something starts to degrade a little bit, and the first parts of the little bit, yeah, fine, you can assume a constant. But after that, the entire integrity of the article 
has deteriorated too much, and then the rate of, of de- decay has to increase. And then if it increases some more and some more, then the rate increases again and again and again. So an article they think is 30,000 years old might only be, I don't know, 2,000 years old, 4,000 years old. This is what they don't understand. I can't believe scientists are so dumb. When a thing starts to decay, the rate of decay increases as it decays the more. It's not like we don't know that, but they're not applying that when it comes to to dating. Okay, so we're going to just assume that the universe is, I don't know, I don't think it's 6,000 actually, something more than 6,000 years old. The Bible would tell us if it was only that old, and it doesn't. It says the opposite says that the universe existed for some undefined amount of time prior to Adam's fall. And from Adam's fall, it's definitely 6,000 years. So how long was that? Oh, I don't know. Pick a number. 10,000 years? 50,000 years? 4 billion? Maybe 10 billion? Who knows? Because the other thing about decay is that it can be slowed down or stopped by something else. And then it resumes again, either faster or slower than before. We know that from biology and science. I don't know why we don't understand that when it comes to evaluating the cosmos. Okay, fine. So let's say that the world was 10 billion years old. That means Satan is 10 billion years or more older, and he still hasn't gotten it yet. Because to him, God did it wrong. Not necessarily God did it wrong on purpose. And since Satan still loves God, it probably thinks that, you know, God made a mistake and just can't see his mistake. Satan thinks he's saving the angels and the universe by fighting God. That's why he's not quit yet. That's why he'll never quit. I mean, maybe you could argue, well, if the world's only 6,000 years old, he needs more time to wake up and smell the coffee. Possibly. But to me, hi, if he's bigger and smarter than me, I didn't need 6,000 years to figure out that what's the difference between God and Satan, why God's right and Satan's not. So why didn't Satan, who's better than me, figure it out? Because power... Addicts. And that's why the strategy is power over love or love over power. That's the whole story going on here. God is showing why power has to be totally controlled by a mature love or it doesn't work. Satan's busy trying to shave things. He's busy trying to create a perfect world without God. That's what he's been doing from the beginning. To show he's more moral than God. And he sponsors sin in order to get you to be motivated to do good deeds. You see somebody murdered or raped, and you go, oh, that's terrible. And that motivates you to try harder to to be good. Most people don't realize how sophisticated a system that is. Because he thinks, hi, if you really loved us, God, you would use your power to make our lives have less suffering. And that means you'd shave this or shave that or shave the other thing to give us a motive and an ability to do good deeds, even if they're not your good. So that we could feel good in ourselves and we'd be happier. He thinks... He's totally sold under the power idea. He thinks that if you had more power, you'd be happier. His big complaint to God, and you can read that yourself in the book of Job, his big complaint to God is that God has to bribe you to make you happy because that's what Satan wants to do. He thinks that we aren't made big enough and high enough and powerful enough. And that if we were, then then we'd do better good deeds and we'd be happy. Big lie. See, 
That's why people down here who seek power, all they ever become is addicted to it, and they remain as clueless as they were in the beginning. Oh, if I get more power, I'll be happier and, and, and better. Really? Never works. Satan's still buying into that idea. And he thinks the fundamental design flaw that God created is that God allowed and continues to allow weakness. So that's why our lives are like Christ's, which ended in weakness, hanging on a cross, doing absolutely nothing. It's all being done to him. And does he stop loving God as a result? No. The Holy Spirit's holding him together, and he could choose to reject God at any point. That would have been a sin, of course. But instead, he kept loving what God was doing because he understood it. He was choosing love over power. He eschewed his own power as God, and he eschewed his own power as a human being, and he relied on the Holy Spirit giving him whatever power the Holy Spirit wanted to give him, which was restricted to just enabling him to keep on receiving the sin. And he suffered more than we'll ever know. But it was love over power. That's the cross. So, how do you use this? You're superior to everybody else around you on at least one thing, whatever it is. As somebody else that's not around you that might be superior to you, but basically you are recognized as having a talent or an ability better than somebody else whether you're doing the recognizing or somebody else is recognizing it. At the same time, there is something you are inferior to others in certain respects. Now, we all kind of know that really easily. We wake up in the morning, and whenever we watch TV, it's always about power over love or love over power and how love will triumph. So we're familiar with the lesson. But then we go and turn off the TV and go to make dinner or do an email or something else, all the superior, inferior, superior, inferior, superior, inferior hits us in the face, whether it's the inferiority of the thing you're working on that breaks or doesn't, Windows doesn't work as, a, as expected or it's some inferiority of some person you were depending on and they didn't come through. Or you're the one that didn't come through. Or they came through in a fantastic way which made you feel like, gee, I couldn't do it that well. How do you feel about that? Do you feel uncomfortable? Well, the flip side is that one of the things we humans are good at is noticing whether somebody's superior to us or not, and we try to take advantage of that a little too often. But sometimes we just flat enjoy the fact that, hi, you're better at math than me. Will you help me in my math homework? So as you go through your day, understanding that this is the grand story, the purpose of the grand strategy, how do you interact with the things that go wrong or right, the people that go wrong or right? Because every single minute, something is going wrong, something is going right. So it's a big drama of this drama. Power over love, love over power. Every single minute you're breathing. It's a drama. It's not meaningless. You're writing an email is not meaningless because your pee is not meaningless. God created it. So, did I get this email right? Not that you're supposed to get anal and spend 90 hours trying to compose an email. But... It's not unimportant. You sit down and have dinner with your friends or your family. That's not 
you know, something that would be put on TV. But at the same time, it's important. How do you play with that? Now, a lot of it is autonomic for us. You know, we don't think that these think about these things, and we don't give them. You know, we don't really like. We're so busy, we don't really spend a lot of time thinking about the meaning of what we're doing. But we can. And guaranteed, every single minute of every single thing we do, however seemingly small, is this grand story playing out. Power over love. So, that's why I keep talking about the role playing. Seeing through God's eyes, seeing through the other person's eyes, seeing through your own eyes. Seeing the war story, you know, the different wars that we all face. Because even in the dullest moments, this is the story. Love over power or power over love. And the more you practice it, the more you see God's own ideas, his own thought pattern in it. And then the value of love and what it is and how all-encompassing it is even for the smallest, stupidest, ugliest, most horrible thing like be will become clearer to you and then your life is more meaningful and then you'll learn the lesson Satan will never learn. Peace out.